counting everything. See that? Yeah. <laughs> That's what you call a DSR. <laughs> the reason, you know, ever since I got shot, my nose never stopped running because I got lead particles in my sinuses. So, but I am an emotional guy. You know, <laughs> under proper circumstances. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was. Um, but you know. Uh, like I say about police corruption, police corruption is the tip of the iceberg, you know. Uh, there's uh, worldwide uh, uh, corruption, and it's in all branches of government and, uh, and medicine. Uh, one of my big triumphs is uh, I'm standing right here. I, when I got shot, uh, I had problems with this leg, and a couple of years ago, I went to a doctor and he says, you're bone on bone. You need a new head. And a guy came out and he gave me a pair of crutches and he says, I said, what's that? He said, the doctor wants you to walk with those. He says, if you fall, you break your hip, you're done. So I went into the doctor and I said, I walk with these, I'm gonna feel like an old man. He said, you are an old man. <laughs> I said, F you. <laughs> I turned around and I walked out. He said, well, you can't take the pain anymore, come back. Mm -hmm. Well, I never went back. And I believe in uh, alternative medicine, but we won't get into that now. Because <laughs> you know, doctors, they're like butchers, you know, they wear a white coat too. So, uh, <laughs> think very carefully because, you know, your parts, I'm 81 years old, and I wasn't meant to get a brand new leg uh, that the rest of me wasn't going to keep up with, but. I walk, I bike, and but anyway, um, I get letters from 13-year-old kids, and I think that's where the hope lies in our youth. I don't know how many of you have um, seen the news on uh, uh, the internet. Uh, we now have a uh, Frank Serpico uh, of Sierra Leone, and is a uh, a woman and an African woman and uh, she is the uh, police uh, commissioner. And uh, she is um, set on not exposing it, uh, not uh, whatever. She's going to get rid of it, she says. And so I wish her the best of luck. But uh, unfortunately, I think too many people believe that, uh, you know, the New York uh, City Police is squeaky clean now. Uh, but there's a lot of work to be done. And I, don't, I want to say that my life has been blessed. Uh, the people that I've met and uh, the knowledge that I extrapolated from studying ever since I left the police department, and which started with my mother, because my mother was an herbalist. And, um, and the only thing I never got, the only thing Frank Serpico never got was justice. And if anybody wants to tell me different, uh, tell them to get in touch and I'll tell them what I'm talking about because as we stand here, my piece of land upstate is eroding. A judge and a district attorney allowed uh, protected wetlands to be bulldozed by a builder. And I have it all on camera, but today <laughs> it is so corrupt that they don't even care you get them on camera. So I want to thank uh, Snowden and people like him who expose the rot that the people at the top are doing to the people of this nation and the world. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll make some questions. And I want to tell you, are any of you guys movie fans? Yeah. Oh. I think so. A very interesting happened, although this is not in a, well, yeah. You, you saw the guy getting washed, his face washed, right? Well, now, that was, um, um, Woody uh, <laughs> I, I, I hear a voice here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, what? It's me. It's me. What? <laughs> 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 Maybe forget his first name. His name is King. Woody. Woody. Woody King. That's the guy, uh, he actually looked like the real guy we were chasing. And it was true, right up until they flushed his face. And poor Woody, 
who, uh, in his own right, became a director and uh, actor and, um, and uh, filmmaker. Um, he put his heart into it. And when he was running, he slipped and fell. And he broke his leg. And as you can see in the documentary, his pants was wet because he slipped. And I know he broke his leg because I want to see him in the hospital. And, uh, and what I objected to in that scene was that that wasn't the real scene. The real scene is when we chased him into this brownstone, he was cowering. Here's this hulk of a black man cowering under the stairs while two white policemen, although I was witnessing, the other guy was menacing him. And I thought we were going to arrest him. And what he was after him for was he was late with his payoff. And, and he's got his gun out and he's saying, your son, I told you nothing. And the guy's saying, I want the balls on my ass. Give me some time. He said, I'll give you the rest of your life and I can if you're late one more time. And while this is happening, the door opens and you see this old black wrinkled face with white hair. And she witnesses. So there's a witness to the corruption. And to me, that was more of a social statement than some guy getting his face, his face flush, flush, <laughs> flush. It was flushing for me. What actually happened, uh, that was Lumet decided to put it in because he was married to um, Lena Horn's daughter. And Lena Horn, uh, her mate uh, was white, and he tried to break her into the chorus line at the uh, Cotton Club, and he got his face flushed in the toilet. So anyway. <laughs> you probably were not even born at that time, but you can look it up. <laughs> now, question, yeah, questions. There's got to be a question out there. I can't hear a damn thing because I'm deaf in one ear. Yes, sir. So what, what, what did you think of the movie Serpico uh, otherwise? What did you think of the movie Serpico otherwise? The movie Serpico, uh, Frank Serpico, the documentary of the movie. The movie, the city oh, the movie. Ah, well, it showed the corruption as it was, but. It was an education for me, too, because um, it showed me that Hollywood has uh, racial profiling, too, because uh, the burglar that uh, Pacino was chasing was actually white. So that was one lesson. And then the other lesson is that uh, in Hollywood, it's who you know, because um, I was dating a young lady in the village, and uh, um, her name was Amy Levitt. And uh, John Allison had open call, and she came, never mentioned my name, and got the part. But when Lumet uh, took over, Amy actually got thrown out with the bath water. Uh, you know, bathroom, uh, the water scene, is, that's in the movie. Um, so that was one reason why I was kind of ticked with Lumet, and it just built up until I just said cut and out of there. Yes. When you went back to the building when you, were, when, you were, when you were shot in the documentary, was that the first time you'd gone back there, or had you been there before? No, no, that, yeah, that was the first time. Yeah. What was that one? It, it got a little uh, um, spruced up since. <laughs> oh, yeah, but uh, actually, uh, a few years back, there was a big arrest there for a big narcotics uh, thing, so, you know, little changes. Let me ask a question for Anton Antonino. Yeah. I was curious about... Um, oh, I thought you had a question. <laughs> do I? Um, what what uh, made you do this... Uh, I mean, it was kind of like a why now question. I mean, have you, have you been thinking about this for a long time, or did you put it off, or did something just really move you to do this in the last few years as opposed to 10 years ago? You know? Uh, it's, it's more of like this kind of evolution of, of a project for me because you know, I discovered the story of Frank Serby when I was 15 and the book first and it was uh, really an astounding thing for me because our backgrounds are so similar, Italian-American from an immigrant family, his father's a cobbler, my father's a bricklayer, but you know also the, the kind of representation of Italian-Americans, I grew up in Philly, was very frustrating, you know, the, in Philly, Rocky is a hero, and he's you know like a mental deficient, not even a real person. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and and, uh, and and then there's all the stereotypes, gangsters, and all these other things. And I it was just there was a lot of commonality there. 
and my father died that year, so it was kind of an inspirational story, you know, the kind of an aspirational story of having honor and integrity. And a lot of these mantras are never wrong when you're right, and only actions count. These are all these things that Frank, Frank says. I, I happened to move to New York, and a few years later, uh, was able to get into the gallery where Frank spoke at the city council uh, mm -hmm. against Giuliani's policing uh, policies. And it, it was an amazing thing to see him, both with how he carried himself, but also how he was treated, uh, some with admiration, some with scorn. And I wrote, was writing notes in a journal saying, you know, one day I'd like to make a film about the real Frank Serpico, because, you know, at that point he already lived almost longer than he had in the Met film. And, um, you know, 20 years later, I approached about another project. Um, we started uh, de developing a relationship. It was many hours on the phone, hanging out of state with him. And just like this, and then this, you know, the, the film is in some ways smashed into history, but it also underscores and underlines Frank's uh, role as this American archetype. Because in many ways, he, he prophesized in 71, if something wasn't done, this would become normalized and codified in, in the system. And it would reach the highest levels of power, which I think we can make a good case that it has. So I think it's a film that maybe I was, I was born to make, you know, and, to, uh, and that's why we're here. I just want to say how difficult it is to, you know, put everything into a documentary. And mm -hmm. uh, when I watch it, I understand it. But to someone who doesn't know the story, uh, for example, when I was talking about being in Holland, uh, I had just been run out of Switzerland by the FBI. And that's why, uh, you know, you say, you don't like the FBI? I Hell no, I don't trust them anymore than I do the cops. I was living in an 1802 Cold War to Chalet in the Swiss Alps, and my phone rings, and I had a witness there, Deputy Commissioner Dave Dorson from New York, and the FBI wants me to come back to New York to testify. And I said to them, is this the FBI that I so admired in my youth? Uh, oh, good, so, I said. And where the hell were you when I needed you, I said. I said, I'm trying to get my life together. You come bust my chops. He says, it's only fair to tell you we have a subpoena out for you. You don't respond. You'll be held in contempt and subject to arrest. And the next morning, Dave called me because I didn't stay at my house. I stood at a French alley. They came after me. I had already rented a car in anticipation, and I had to leave Holland, uh, Switzerland. I ended up in Holland. And that's why when I saved the girl that was drowning, I thought, just, I don't need any alpha lades, let the, somebody else get it. And so it's a little out of sequence in the movie because what happened <laughs> following that, my dog Alfie was barking and there was a burglar breaking into a houseboat and I called the cops and that's when they got my identity and then the two detectives came and took me to headquarters and I thought, oh boy, I'm out of here now. Instead, the commissioner whose name was Endlich, which in English means finally, <laughs> 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 I'm not a <laughs>